So welcome everybody. Thank you so much for uh, sharing your Tuesday evening with us. Um, uh, just This is a meeting which is about the draft open plan. So the draft open plan uh, was published three weeks ago and the public comment period on this draft is open until May 1st. So Department of City planning staff are here this evening, at least some of them. I saw Thomas uh, and the things maybe if you guys would like to unmute yourselves and introduce yourselves. Um, just so people know you're here. Hi, everyone. I'm oh. Stephanie Joy. Hi, Hello, I'm Thomas Chair. Lovely. Okay. We're both uh, with the Department of City Planning. Um, we're here to listen and, and answer questions. Um, thank you for hosting. Thank you so much for coming. So yeah, just to clarify, so this is our meeting, not city plannings in the, in the sense that we're not here to go tonight uh, exhaustively through the plan. Um, we are uh, going to be presenting our preliminary thoughts about the plan to you, Oakland residents, and our plan tonight is that we tell you what we're thinking, and then you tell us what you're thinking, and then we spend the next couple of weeks asking folks all over Oakland what they're thinking, and then we will come back to you at the end of April with what we've heard. Um, the plan has dropped, the draft plan has dropped. We have until May 1st to submit public comments uh, on it. Uh, we'll be sure that all the comments that folks provide at this evening's meeting are delivered to city planning. And we also encourage you to visit the plan site, uh, which is engaged.pittsburghpa.gov slash Oakland. And maybe one of my colleagues would be so kind as to drop that in the chat. Uh, OPDC is also hosting a paper copy of the plan at 294 Semple Street. Uh, please come by any time during business hours. Um, and there are also a series of posters that the Department of City Planning has placed around the neighborhood that have QR codes that you can use to access site-specific projects and programs. So you can provide comments that way. Next slide. <clears throat> Next slide. Thank you. So the Oakland plan is divided into four sections, development, mobility, community, and infrastructure. Development is everything that has to do with the built environment, rules about what can and cannot be built, zoning, programs that support and encourage the kind of development that Oakland needs to thrive. Uh, affordable housing, occupancy rules, those are important issues here. And uh, as our commercial district growth and planning guidelines for public spaces and streetscapes. Mobility is about how people get around in Oakland, how people get into and out of Oakland. Uh, and how to support or encourage different kinds of transportation modes. So sidewalks, streets, bike lanes, trails, parking rules, how to manage electric scooters, bus routes, all of that is in there. Community should be where we discuss initiatives to support, protect, nurture, and grow people's connections to each other in Oakland. How can we best meet the community's needs? Public health and safety, public art, resources for community supports and organizing, all of that goes there. Uh, and lastly, infrastructure is about improving systems that support neighborhood functioning and sustainability. It's all the built and natural environment that isn't covered explicitly by development and mobility, utilities, stormwater management, tree canopy, ecosystem support, and ways of organizing and prioritizing public and private investments to make Oakland more sustainable and resilient for the future. Uh, each chapter has a set of goals. Wait, <clears throat> hold on. <laughs> Each chapter has a set of goals, which are meant to be vision statements for what Oakland can and should become. And then there are policies, which are the roadmaps for achieving those goals. And then there are projects and programs, which are the tools for implementing the policies. Or to put it another way, the goals are like dreams, and the policies are the plans for how to make those dreams come true. And the projects and the programs are the specific steps that we need to take. Um, and then in addition to the goals, policies, projects, and programs that are in the plan, city planning is also proposing three brand new zones in Oakland, employment, urban center mixed use, and residential mixed use. Uh, and they're also proposing the extension of the inclusionary zoning overlay district to include all of Oakland that's not in the educational, medical, and institutional use zone. So the zoning proposals have their own engaged pages where you can leave comments. But for tonight, we're focusing on the way those zones are described in the Oakland plan itself. Um, so what I'm going to do here is spend a little bit of time talking about OPDC's take on each of the chapters of the plan. And we would like to hear your thoughts as we go. 
So if you have a question or a comment at any time, please drop your question in the chat or raise your hand. We can have a conversation uh, as, as we go through this. So, okay, next slide. <clears throat> so first up is development. Uh, there is a lot in this chapter and a lot of it gets pretty technical. Wanda has been populating the comments on the Engage page for this chapter, and I invite you all to check out and comment on her comments there. Uh, but right now I'm going to hand the mic to Wanda to talk through the main areas of interest in the development chapter. Thanks, Andrea. Hi, everybody. Thanks for joining us tonight. I'm glad to see everybody. And um, I want to acknowledge that we, you know, have had some participation in the Engage site. I've been very happy to see that. Um, so thanks to those of you who've been putting comments in. We want to um, keep having that happening. So a couple of you on um, on the, the meeting tonight have been doing that. I really appreciate it. Um, so yeah, and you can see everybody's comments and there's a button that lets you say load more. So you can see all of them. Sometimes they don't all show at one time. If you keep clicking load more, you'll see them. Um, and you can also comment on somebody else's comment and do a thumbs up if it's something that you agree with. Um, you can do a thumbs down as well if it's something you disagree with. Um, so there is a lot in the development um, section. One of the things that we're particularly concerned about um, is that it doesn't specifically set a goal for restoring, preserving, um, and fostering home ownership in Oakland. Uh, sort of alludes to it a couple of times, but I think we really want to have a very, very clear goal. Um, and uh, similar to the, the goal in Oakland 2025, which uh, really sets that out for certain areas as a, as a clear goal. Um, and the Community Land Trust is our strategy in the Oakland community uh, to maintain home ownership and permanently um, and to have permanent affordable home ownership. And it's a very important strategy for the Oakland community to achieve this goal of um, encouraging, supporting, and growing home ownership in Oakland. So, um, so we're really, um, you know, it's one of our main um, points throughout our comments and um, something we'd like to hear from you. But without, um, without the community land trust, the Oakland community land trust specifically. Um, highlighted as um, as a very specific goal um, and or tool to achieve the goal, um, you know we find that to be a real a real problem for this plan. Um, we presented the land trust to the steering committee and have talked about it very uh, very thoroughly throughout the entire process. Um, so we want to make sure that it's highlighted. Um, we want to grow the community land trust to scale and really look at a variety of ways that we can apply resources to the, the different types of methods that we can scale the CLT um, you know, to ways that different pathways that homes can become part of the CLT. Uh, there are a variety of them and we'd like to lay those out. So I do uh, list those in my comments and we'll be um, you know, uh, looking for those edits in the plan. Um, there's there's some stuff about um, there's a lot of confusion really about um, affordable housing uh, for 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 undergraduate students you know housing that they can afford to rent um, and then there's also there's a lot of good stuff in the plan right now about certainly inclusionary zoning and having you know um, bonuses for affordable housing and these kinds of things that are in the plan. Um, but I think we need to specify more, more carefully and um, describe more clearly um, that undergraduates, full-time undergraduate students wouldn't be eligible for affordable housing the way it's defined um, by HUD and a lot of the subsidy programs in, that meet requirements for like inclusionary zoning, the affordable housing bonus points, um, undergraduate students wouldn't be eligible for that, for those units. Um, so we're still really missing, um, the, the plan doesn't really speak to the issue that if we have a lot of new uh, rental development coming into the neighborhood, we might just continue to see prices for rental housing escalating 
at prices that don't meet the needs of undergraduate students would can continue to put pressure in um, the single family areas of the neighborhood where we really want to use the community land trust to have affordable home ownership for existing residents, um, long-term residents, especially residents um, you know, who've been part of the community, maybe renting now, um, certainly people of color um, having an opportunity to become homeowners um, in the neighborhood. So, um, so we really would like to see, and we offer some comments in the Engage page about how we can clarify that. There's some, some good intention and in descriptions about equitable development, um, but we really wanna make clear that what we wanna do is leverage new development to support the Oakland resident community needs, um, especially under-resourced um, and marginalized members of our community. So priorities for those resources are affordable housing, neighborhood serving retail, um, employment opportunities specific to Oakland residents um, and other, other am amenities and services and programs that support residents who live in 15213, especially lower income people. Um, and related to value capture is this idea of a community reinvestment fund, which is certainly very exciting um, and a nice opportunity for the community. But I think we really wanna um, more narrowly define uh, the, the potential uses of that, of that fund and really understand exactly how it gets funded. Um, and there's a lot of places throughout the plan where it's just sort of like, oh, Oh, this community reinvestment fund could go to this, but some of the things are things that may not be beneficial to um, low-income residents in Oakland or just Oakland resident, you know, permanent residents in Oakland. Period, uh, which is something that you know that we're concerned about. Um, we want to really target, I guess, target those funds. Um, and there's, there's some language that talk about buildings that belong in Oakland, but I think what we would prefer to, to see is a goal statement about valuing neighborhood character and historic preservation, and really a statement about, you know, how we manage development at various scales, being in close proximity to each other and reducing harm on lower intensity uses. Um, and you know, a, a very intentional statement of having ways, design guidelines and other tools um, and just the plan really speaking to the fact that there are, you know, we need to look out for those at a structural disadvantage. Um, you know, we don't want to, um, to have situations where somebody is sort of called out as being like anti-development or a NIMBY or something like that when people are simply looking out for their quality of life, neighborhood character, integrity of their community. Um, so I think we can do a little bit better job about addressing, addressing that and coming up with ways that through design guidelines and, and that kind of thing and really having the plan speak to that, which is something that we, we deal with pretty regularly here in Oakland. Um, there's also a, a project page that you can click on called Oakland Town Center. Um, that's this area that's down by the Zulima Park um, at the Boulevard of the Allies um, and Zulima Street. Um, I'm not sure that that's a name that people feel is, is a compelling name for that, the future redevelopment of that area. Certainly would love to hear what people thought about that and get some other ideas maybe of something that would be more, um, more a name that people that resonated with people. But at this time, when you click on the link, you only go to um, the workshop page that was, um, you know, and I think the plan needs to actually have, you know, here is, here's how we really see this area being, being redeveloped. We'd like to see in the plan a statement regarding residential neighborhood conservation areas that if we're doing a land use map, uh, which the plan contains, that really saying the lower uh, density residential and the medium density residential are areas to be preserved for that type of land use 
and that um, this way aggressive speculators are forewarned that zoning changes will not be um, uh, permitted in those areas that would assist policymakers such as the Planning Commission and Zoning Board, uh, as well as the community around really making it very clear um, you know, that, that that kind of action is not worthy of pursuit in those areas. Um, there's a lot about zoning that we can't, we don't even have time to go into tonight. And I'm about done on this section, just in terms of the amount of time we want to spend sort of sharing our thoughts with you. Um, what we at OPDC plan to do is spend more time analyzing the zoning recommendations um, and uh, really analyzing, you know, are the uses that are being proposed for the new districts the appropriate, how, do, how are we addressing the scale issue where the lower intensity areas meet up with um, the more intense areas. This was something that anybody who attended the um, planning commission hearing recently um, about uh, the zone change in the um, Halkett Street and Boulevard of the Allies area would have seen the Planning Commission really calling that out as something that needs more analysis. We agree with that and, um, you know, would like to be able to, um, to complete that and have more conversation with the community. We'll certainly be putting more comments on the Engage site as we do that, maybe even offering other, um, other review and analysis. The scale of what the proposals talk about really, in, you know, it's, it's an interesting idea that is coming up in the zoning of, you know, of re really having the base height and development envelope be relatively modest unless the developer were to invest and use some of the bonuses that of things that we want to have happen. Um, but I think it just needs a little, that's a creative approach, right? Um, Performance-based zoning, that kind of thing can be useful, but I think we want to really dig into the details and see what it's really going to look like. Uh, will we really get the kind of benefit that's going to help the Oakland community, residential communities needs and, um, and do a little bit more analysis of that. Um, also maybe the boundaries of, so there's sort of, there's the uses that are allowed, the height scale massing that's allowed, and then just simply where the boundaries are drawn. Um, and again, where those edge conditions meet up. So more to come on that. We want to dig in more, do more analysis, look at the way some of these bonuses are going to work. Um, and uh, we're still in the middle of doing that. I think that's pretty much, Andrea, if I, um, there's a lot more we could say um, about the development chapter, but I think that gives people hopefully a flavor of what some of our concerns are and some of our feedback to city planning. I'd love to pause and see if anybody has any questions or anything they'd like to add or comment. Kathy Gallagher. Gallagher has a hand raised. Um, I'd like to, before I even make my comment, I want to thank you, Wanda, for, wow, going through that proposal. I've been following your comments on the Engage site, and you have clarified a lot of things, and it's obvious that you've paid a lot of attention. So <laughs> thank you for your efforts on that. Um, I for your comments, Kathy, on the page as well. <laughs> well, mine aren't nearly as thorough as yours are, but... Um, I, I agree with you that I, I find it very confusing and I've been working on the Oakland plan from the beginning, but I found it very confusing the difference between the development section and the community section. And some of the things that you outlined in development, we've discussed in community. And even at the open house this past week, there was a great deal of time spent on um, discussion of items that are listed in development and community. So it was kind of confusing, um, like home ownership, is that, is that development or is that community? Um, so I agree with you on that 100% that that part of it is very 
it's confusing and I think it's also kind of redundant if you're looking for home ownership and permanent residence in Oakland, where do you look in the plan? It's, it's, it's not clear. And um, I also agree with you about the preservation of residential communities. Again, is that development or is that community? Um, I've heard it discussed in both of those areas during the development of the plan. And, um, and we spent a lot of time at the public meeting just last week in, in the community section discussing um, the encouragement of permanent residents in Oakland. And I agree with you that I don't think that it's, it's not mentioned in a very prominent place in the actual plan. So that's my comments on development or community, I'm not sure which. <laughs> Thanks, Kathy. Yeah, yes, that is a lot of, and I think we'll wrap up sort of at the end of how we'd like, you know, to sort of sort things, right? And so we make some recommendations and the, the you know, I think the thing to keep in mind is that, you know, you could have something related to housing in both sections, but, you, you know, it's more of the bricks and mortar kinds of things are in development and the more programmatic kinds of things are in generally in community and they need to relate to each other, but we don't really want to have exact duplication because it doesn't help us then as we're moving into implementation of the plan, um, you know, to, to just sort of be wading through um, a lot of extra stuff. So we also are making some suggestions of where can we tighten uh, where can we consolidate and, um, you know, and have a, a plan that's easier for us to follow into implementation. Yeah, I agree with you. And I, I, I've noticed in your comments, they should be moved into this. And I, I, I totally agree, especially when you talk about attracting permanent residents to Oakland. How do you, you know, you can't be tearing down the housing stock and encouraging people to move to Oakland and not provide for some replacement of that housing stock. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, Millie has her hands up. Really? I'm here, I'm just trying to unmute. Sorry, I was too fast on the draw. I, I, I have a question about this, the whole process is, I mean, cause I've, I have read Wanda's comments and other comments, Kathy's comments were good too. I've added some comments, uh, but what, I'm a little confused on what do I think anything is going to happen to the comments that I make or the thumbs up that I give to somebody else, I feel like I'm, um, I, I feel like I'm wasting my time, frankly. Uh, you know, I've, I've read and read and I go back and read and I go back at the comments and I see who's responded to mine or, or whatever. And I just think it goes into a vast vacuum and, and, and I, I'm not sure that anything is going to come out of my efforts to make any, and the other efforts to make it a better, better um, document. Um, so I, I, don't know, I just want to know what makes us think that anybody will actually um, look at our comments and take action on them rather than just say, well, we got this from so-and-so, or this came from this part of the code, or we borrowed this from Uptown. There's wonderful bonus points. So whoopee-doo, bonus points. What says, who says that's the best? Now, I realize the steering committee has worked for years on this, and I've only been on the little team things. Um, and, and yeah, the city has to put a stake in the ground and say, this is the best way to do it. But then, you know, I, I feel I feel a lot of frustration, and I'm not sure that um, I'm glad to have another month to comment, and I will comment more. Uh, but but I just don't think that my comments are going to go anywhere. So Thank I'm you. really glad you brought this up, Millie. But I was planning on getting to this at the end when we talk more about process. But I mean, why not address it right now? So the question that we had that was specifically that exactly what you just said was um, maybe the uh, SJ and um, Thomas can talk a little bit about what the city's plan is for, um, you know, incorporating the comments and recommendations into a fresh draft of the plan that the public can see before it goes to planning commission. Um, and so we're kind of wondering what the plan is there. So public comments come in through May 1st. 
Um, we are reviewing public comments, every single one of them with the associated action teams um, for you know, determining whether we're going to make a recommendation for a change to the planning commission. That will, the you know, compilation of recommendations to the planning commission along with all of the public comments will be given to the planning commission a week in advance that's posted on the planning commission website. And this information is also posted on the engage page, the very front page at the bottom right hand side. So the recommendations and comments will be made available one week in advance of the public hearing, which is May 17th. So there's no plan to, to actually draft a new document. Meaning the changes that you're suggesting that DCP will have reviewed and determined whether or not a change needs to be made with the action team leads and potentially the steering committee it depends on the scale of the comments. Um, I, I, we are getting a lot, so that could be the case. Um, but the plan was drafted over a number of years. The steering committee did review this for months. Um, well, I mean, you and I both know that some of the changes were entered at the very last possible minute with the steering committee. So not everything actually came in front of everybody. Um, and residents yeah. aren't residents aren't represented significantly on the steering committee. So Kathy Gallagher has a question about whether or not the action teams, the people who served on the action teams, not just the action team leads, would have a chance to reconvene. It was essentially the staff that that staffed them. That was the thought. We weren't going to reconvene action teams, no. Well, I think, um, you know, we, we might want to revisit this at the end of the meeting, certainly more about process and um, the ways that public feedback will be incorporated into the plan. Uh, I think it's important, though, for us to continue to describe the extent to which we believe changes need to be made to the plan to reflect the concerns um, of residents and uh, the community. And, uh, you know, our staff did a lot of analysis and we've, you know, provided quite a bit of comments in other sections. So Andrea is ready to review that. And like we said, we even have more analysis to do about the zoning proposals um, and we'll be continuing to do that and offer that analysis to the community at another date. We, we don't even have the ability to go you know, into that and still have time to do the other sections tonight. Um, we will move ahead as quickly as we possibly can and we'll circle back at the end, more questions about process. Maybe at that point, it can become clearer for all of us what the next steps could be for city planning and for plan participants. So um, next slide, please. <laughs> Moving on. Um, ooh. This is out of order for me. Okay, sorry, my fault, my fault. Um, <clears throat> so the next slide here is we're gonna be talking about community um, and the community chapter, uh, and it isn't just that there's overlap, uh, it's legit pretty hard to read. Uh, and if you had trouble navigating it, please be assured, so did we. Uh, OPDC staff really took this section apart. Uh, Wanda has provided a lot of comments on the Engage site already, and we will be adding to those comments in the coming days. Uh, and you should too. But it is important to say at the outset <clears throat> uh, that this chapter is the least finished, in our opinion, of all the planned chapters. And the connections between the goals, the policies, the projects, and the programs are the hardest to navigate and understand of all of the chapters. Um, OPDC think a lot about the contents of this chapter because this is a significant portion of the work that we do in Oakland. Um, planning could have done more to research and talk with existing service providers to learn what kinds of services are currently available in Oakland uh, and what the challenges are to providing those services and what services are missing. Um, so a few things that uh, staff really called out uh, reading the uh, community chapter, uh, the, the first and the biggest issue that hit everybody in the stomach uh, was that was challenging institutional racism. 
um, how exactly? <laughs> Oakland is pretty segregated uh, and institutional racism is embedded in every system that is supposed to support our community. So achieving this goal is obviously aspirational, uh, but what's really missing from the plan are policies and programs that specifically address this. It's hard to make progress on making Oakland more welcoming to new immigrants or halting the displacement of black homeowners uh, or to engage constructively with law enforcement if we're not braced to confront racist assumptions head on. This is a lot of work and a lot of community organizing and engagement, a lot of collaborative work with investors and funders and institutional and public stakeholders. You know, celebrating diversity is something that's only possible when the systems designed to support folks are not conspiring to keep them down. Uh, and that segues nicely into the question of enforcement versus policing uh, and different understandings of, understandings of public safety. Um, so the community chapter has some lukewarm intent when it comes to code enforcement. Uh, and weirdly, it doesn't acknowledge the work already being done by Oakwatch, for example, uh, nor does it engage with the challenges to making code enforcement more responsive and transparent. Uh, enforcing occupancy laws and building codes are public health concerns. We are aware that neighbors sometimes use code complaints as proxies for other kinds of complaints and disagreements. Uh, it's a layered issue. Uh, and implemented badly, it can make more vulnerable Oakland residents feel more unsafe than they already do. Um, there are a lot of mentions of police in this chapter in places where we felt it was inappropriate and weird. Um, and sort of relatedly, the project to support protests and public assembly activities was not about making institutions and law enforcement more supportive or protective of protests and gatherings, but about correcting protester behavior as if protesters in Oakland were the sole perpetrators of violence, as if police in unmarked vans hadn't also made Oakland residents and visitors feel unsafe during the most recent set of big protests here. Um, so like there's a, there's a responsiveness thing. Like on the one hand, we do need police to, you know, uh, uh, corral out of control behavior, you know, to break up an enormous party where everybody is underage and drunk and things like that. We absolutely do need the police to be responsive in those cases. But then there are lots of other kinds of enforcement issues where honestly, perhaps the police are, and the enforcement agencies are um, not, not, not always uh, uh, prepared on some level for uh, the ways in which uh, their interference can make people feel more unsafe. Uh, halting displacement. Uh, there are uh, some strategies for aging in place, home, home repair and investment. A lot of that is kind of missing. Uh, there is one program that is mentioned in this chapter for supporting homeowners with home repair funds, but the chapter doesn't acknowledge that there are existing programs. Uh, we've worked in the past with the URA and with state and private funds to support facade grants and other home repair supports. Um, so there, there needs to be a lot more in there uh, about those kinds of strategies. Um, but it's not just about home repair and modification. There's also a need for mental health supports and social services for residents. Um, we at OPDC, we struggle all the time to connect Oakland residents with supports for hoarding and housekeeping, dealing with infestations of various sorts, neglect, isolation. Um, there are missed opportunities throughout this chapter to advocate for stronger programs and initiatives to address mental health issues. Um, for example, OBDC's community services staff read this and immediately asked why the proposed program to install emergency care equipment in public spaces around Oakland wouldn't also include Nexalone or even just phone numbers for mental health support lines like the suicide prevention lifeline and so forth. Um, so support for community organizing needs to be lifted up as more of a priority. This staff uh, <clears throat> takes a lot of work, uh, and, but there's no successful initiative without it. <laughs> Building social capital among Oakland residents is a high priority to develop strong social networks for Oakland residents themselves. Uh, and this will support strong resident organizations and better networks to connect residents to resources and civic engagement opportunities. You know, people have to know that their voices really count and that um, they, they can in fact connect with their neighbors and with the city at large this way. Uh, and then lastly, we wanted to point out that the community centers and pub public facility, there is lots of community interest in this uh, and there are lots of opportunities uh, for some really terrific initiatives, uh, but the plan is really sparse on details. Uh, so this would be a great area for folks to weigh in with ideas and context, what kinds of services are needed, what kinds of activities can existing spaces support, um, what kinds of stuff would be nice, what kind of stuff is crucial, what, what kinds of programs are uh, neighborhood associations uh, set up already to deliver. 
what kinds of support would they need, that kind of thing. Um, so before I move on to the next slide, does anybody have any questions or comments on what I've said? Or other things that I didn't say that I should have said? Hi, Andrea, this is Elena. I just put in the chat, um, I don't think there's enough for the older residents of Oakland and throughout the plan, they were never consider considered as another marginalized group. Um, the shuttle, um, you know, housing needs, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, totally. I absolutely, I, I absolutely put uh, older Oakland residents into the vulnerable category, but you're absolutely right that it should be really explicit that that is actually true. And um, I mean, part of the reason for, you know, why it's a little bit difficult to navigate the site and how this plan is a little bit convoluted and so forth. Like, the decision to go all online was a COVID response, but, um, and it made the participation in this plan, you know, more accessible to certain populations, but totally inaccessible to precisely these vulnerable people who live in Oakland. Um, and it has been really, really hard to think of a way to kind of like pull back people back in um, if you're trying to, you know, no offense, mom, I know you're on this call, but like if you're trying to engage your 80 year old parents into saying <clears throat> straight up, like, you know, like, oh, it's really simple. You just engage in this website where you pull it down and then you can enter your comments. I mean, it's just really hard. It's challenging. And it's been especially difficult to really get people's input in a meaningful way, you know, during the process so that what is in here can really reflect, um, you know, people's lived experiences. So, sorry. So that's me saying yes, 100% to what you just said. And I would, if I could just go back again to what Kathy Gallagher was saying earlier, where there's sort of overlap. And I think we want community to talk about uh, the community section, to talk about some of the programs that are associated with some of the th the goals that might also be regulated in development. So, you know, programs for, you know, um, people to help with home repair, you know, those kinds of things to support aging in place, the, the way the, pr the program itself um, you know, the way that it's operated and organized, um, you know, can be in the community section, um, you know, regulations related to, you know, development and that kind of thing, um, you know, and resources and land use would be in development just to kind of help us kind of organize our thoughts a little. You know, and we do have a lot of resources for um, specifically these kinds of, of needs that we know, um, you know, a lot of seniors in the community have a lot of just low income um, residents in the community. And we really want to make sure that they're very well articulated um, and that it's specific to, you know, to Oakland and not just sort of generic. Happy to circle back to this also if people have additional thoughts later on. Does anybody have anything now before we move on to mobility? I'd just like to say, I put it in the chat, but nobody read it. So uh, yeah, the, the adding uh, older residents as a specific concern was mentioned very early on at the action teams, but part for the course, uh, the staff that put together obviously left it out because it's not there. Okay, thanks, Mark. Okay, so <clears throat> next slide, please let us know if we want to come back to something, it's totally fine. Um, so this is mobility. Uh, so the mobility chapter reflects a lot of work by Domi and the Port Authority uh, and the consultants that they hired who did workshops and participated in the action team meetings. Um, but it's important to note for everybody who did participate in that process that there's been a lot of staff turnover. So we have new mobility planners in uh, at Domi and uh, new staff at Department of City Planning who are overseeing this, uh, new folks also at Port Authority. So um, there might be some discontinuities a little bit. Um, <clears throat> the first thing that really jumped out uh, at us was um, that there's kind of a missing goal in this section, which is about uh, um, making it easier to not have a car when you live in Oakland. Um, there's lots of reasons why having a car is essential for lots of people, 
uh, and that's perfectly understandable. Um, but then there are many people for whom having a car is not essential. Uh, and it, we, we would like very much for it to be articulated as a goal in the plan that we are reducing the need to actually own a vehicle. So maybe that is supported by, say, for instance, you know, more ride share programs or more car share programs uh, or <clears throat> different ways in which you can sort of increase the cost of keeping an, a car in Oakland. Uh, but unless we, re we reduce the demand for residential parking as well, for instance, then we're not going to be able to make a dent in the other stuff. Um, so there's a lot of things that are in the plan that are about reducing uh, the need for commuters or visitors to use cars to come into Oakland, um, but there's not as much which is specifically about residents. Um, uh, sidewalks are for people. Um, <clears throat> we get a lot of comments about um, the state of uh, Oakland sidewalks, and I think that they're that is called out in the uh, plan, um, but I think that we could probably do more to safeguard pedestrian safety on sidewalks um, than we have uh, in here. So um, I, I know that lots of people have lots of ideas. Among the things that we hear often have to do with the licensing and management of scooters, for instance, and the way that they get parked literally across uh, sidewalks and trails and uh, rights of way. Um, there's a lot of sidewalk obstruction that happens that is the result of trash containment, and we'll get into that later also with the um, infrastructure. Um, there's, there's many different ways in which sidewalks are obstructed, and it, there's, this should really be something that Domi has uh, some pretty clear policies about how to address here. Um, parking, every Oakland resident's favorite topic of all time. If you get two Oakland residents together, at some point they will talk about parking. I am count myself obviously among those people. <laughs> um, it, I just want to say for the record, it's our opinion, honestly, that the hybrid uh, RPPP program is not appropriate for Oakland uh, because it doesn't really address the underlying dysfunction of the RPP program here, uh, which is that um, each of the Oakland RPP districts is oversubscribed uh, and there simply isn't enough or any really spare capacity to share uh, with commuters and visitors. So the hybrid uh, concept is that like, if you have the, um, <clears throat> if you have res residential sticker parking and it is very close to an area where people are paying for parking, that the people who are paying for parking on the street should be able to park in the RPP zone uh, and pay for parking in that zone as well. Uh, and that this will sort of broaden the opportunities for visitors to come and park in the neighborhood. But the problem that we have is that you know, the existing districts are oversubscribed and um, it, it tends to force or encourage um, residents to park illegally in a lot of different weird configurations in order to be able to just find the spot uh, for their car uh, within the same neighborhood as their house. Um, and that's, that's not something that's really quite well articulated here. Um, the, the <clears throat> it got stated over and over again in plan meetings. Uh, but it strangely wasn't included in the what we heard section of the RPP program page. Um, the RPP program page seems to think it's all about enforcement and it's not, it's mostly about the fact that there's just too many. So um, there needs to be some bigger vision solution for limiting uh, eligibility for parking permits. Uh, for example, perhaps Oakland could have an overlay in the RPP program that requires cars here to be registered at an address in the district. Uh, or at the very least in Pennsylvania, as is already required by law for anyone resident in the state for more than 90 days, uh, in order to be eligible for a permit. That would solve a lot of our problems. Um, uh, intersections. <clears throat> intersections are for both pedestrians uh, and for cars, traffic, bicycles, buses, trucks. Uh, and traffic safety is about more than just calming. Um, so a lot of about a lot of the traffic safety has a lot to do with clarity, uh, and I think that intersections could really be dealt with more um, explicitly uh, in the plan, uh, <clears throat> and that's important um, there. Sorry, Mark, you have your hand up. You want to say something before I keep going? Uh, I'll do it at the end. Okay. Or I mean, at the end of this section, at least. Okay. <laughs> Um, there are several sample projects uh, in the chapter that propose bicycle track connections, and that is great. <laughs> uh, 
uh, but a lot uh, they need a lot more thought. Uh, there are some key missing connections, such as the intersection of the boulevard and Bates, and in fact, actually, really anything along Bates. There's kind of a, and then something magical happens, and the bicycle is able to get from this side to the other side. I mean, we we do need a lot more planning on that. But the and I appreciate it that most of the projects that are in the plan right now are kind of like examples of ways to apply the policies. Uh, and to solve this problem and that each of them would require like a whole, you know, separate visioning exercise, obviously, to be uh, implemented. So it, one shouldn't assume that the project that's there is like, boom, you press the button and it just goes. It's more like these are some things about that we could do, you know. So um, I just feel like for people to really adequately imagine or to kind of like wrap their brains around what's being proposed, then it kind of just needs to be uh, explained exactly how those things connect. Uh, with stuff that people do understand and can um, can contextualize. Uh, transit planning, we'd just like to encourage Port Authority and Domi to work together with PennDOT and city planning to continue actively looking for a north-south corridor. Please. Um, <clears throat> there are some projects that have some missing details, as I was just explaining, um, and that could, it's understandable. Um, as, I, as I said, but it could be better explained in the plan that you're all aware of what the missing pieces are. Um, one of the examples is the South Neville, um, which is the question of how to ensure bicycle and pedestrian safety between John Kerr and um, the Neville at Fifth Avenue, um, <clears throat> which there's a, you know some difference of opinion about how that should happen, but it's at the moment just really kind of vaguely stated. and maybe some of the possibilities that people could then voice, like we prefer this option or that option, or this could really work for us, um, might make it easier for people to kind of wrap their brains around it. Um, <clears throat> the Juno and Fraser Street steps are missing. Indeed, a lot of the things about improving steps are just kind of, and then we should improve steps. And you're like, well, <laughs> sure. <laughs> but maybe, maybe something a little bit more specific. Um, there are a couple sets of steps that are um, in danger of being eradicated altogether, and that's sort of sad. So there's the steps that are the Juno Street steps next to the Anderson Bridge, for instance, are wood, are missing a lot of their treads, um, and the Ayers Street steps uh, in Oak Cliff are similarly, they have all their treads but are a little rickety and could probably use some love in order to be able to make sure that there is a pedestrian connection for folks in Oak Cliff to get to Second Avenue. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Rock, Rock Alley was kind of missing also completely from this section and a lot of the other um, visioning projects for like really, you know, building new robust connections for um, pedestrian access out of Oakland. Um, and I talked through a bunch of those with you guys, um, with Steve and with Thomas at the um, last open house that I went to. Uh, so I appreciate that. So that's what I got for mobility at the moment. Um, anybody mark you want to jump in uh yeah first of all i mean the oakland plan is 10 years they're not going to get rid of current cars in 10 years the university of pittsburgh institutional master plan you know and i've said this ad, ad nauseum uh their 10-year plan with more aggressive than they already have free free bus passes uh you know satellite parking shuttles uh ride shares van pools etc 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 somehow they're going to increase that uh, aggressively and yet they're only going to drop their single occupancy vehicle usage from 45 percent their expected to use drop is from 45 to 42 percent that's a drop in the bucket it does nothing so in 10 years we're still going to have at least the same amount of cars in oakland and we're going to add more the new you know the building at fifth and halkett is 700 people the proposed uh the, you know 300 unit um replacing marathon uh, Wexford's plans, at least, was another 700. You know, everything's building, 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 and there's no, you know, outside of no excess parking, we have no excess traffic capacity to add all these cars, and it's not going to do it. I think it's, uh, for instance, also the uh, public benefits agreement that, with the Ganey administration. I think it was irresponsible of them. The one, the one and only thing that they had said about closing Zalima Street was until there's a left turn on outbound Boulevard of the Allies onto Bates Street. What is that going to do? What about the right-hand turn from Bates Street onto the Boulevard of the Allies? What about the left turn from inbound going down to Bates Street? There, I mean, it's just irresponsible to, to start giving away things and, and reducing things like required amounts of parking when there's absolutely not going to be any relief for, for anyone. It's just going to make Oakland that much more undesirable to live in. 
uh, enforcement, 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 enforcement. Bikes, scooters, all of them. Things with, you know, these bikes with no lights at night. Uh, they don't stop at stop signs. They go the wrong way. They don't, you know, they're they're they think that because they're the pedestrian means that it has pedals too. Apparently, riding at you know 15, 20 miles an hour through crosswalks. It's ridiculous. Um, and also, I just ha I noticed on my new car registration. Uh, and maybe I just never noticed it before. There's a $5 charge for living in Allegheny County to help pay for road repairs. Uh, so I'm paying more to live here, but someone with an out, out of county and especially like you were saying, out of state plates on their cars because they're students, they're exempted from that. They're not paying that five bucks and they're still able to get a parking permit, even though their car may, not, may or may not be safe because they, they come from a state that doesn't have inspections, whether or not they have insurance uh, and even if they do have insurance, tech, my understanding is technically that uh, if your car is housed somewhere else besides your residence where your insurance is, that you're supposed to tell your insurance company because they may charge you more. That's not a requirement for the RPP. Uh, it should be, at least. I mean, once again, we're trying to get rid of cars. Let's use the very simple thing. If you don't live here, if your car is not registered here, that you either pay more or you don't get a permit, period. Um yeah, bicycle connections, uh, intersections are for pedestrians. Yeah, once again, like you said, people going through skateboards, um, you know, motorized skateboards. Um, I'm trying to think of all the other things. But again, yeah, the, the, the spin scooters, they're like Legos. They let, kids just leave them everywhere. I've seen them ride them drunk. I've seen them ride them with two and three people on them. I've seen them ride them, you know, through stop signs. That... <sighs> If that's not a part of it, then they're, they, they might as well just abandon having a, a transportation strategy at all. Uh, and I'm done. Yeah, so a lot more clarity is needed about appropriate uses for the cartway and the sidewalks. Um, and if the city is going to license things like the spin scooters, then there need to be really clear regulations about where those things can be parked. Um, <clears throat> Similarly to the way that the healthy ride bicycles have to be docked, um, there should be parking areas for the spin scooters, especially in areas where they're in heavy use. Yeah, and I'm not sure. Uh, also, I'm sorry, I thought I was done. <laughs> but just the other day, I was at Panera, and I saw somebody on what was clearly not an, a spin scooter. Uh, and my understanding was that somehow, I, and I don't, I don't know if the if the some exclusivity on scooters was only for rentals, but you know, if there is some, you know, like you're saying, it, it, all of this stuff sh apparently should should have to need to be registered because if someone's riding an unregistered, some other brand scooter that doesn't meet the qualifications, it doesn't have the geolocation to shut it down for going in the wrong places and going on highways, what's the point? I mean, again, enforcement, enforcement, enforcement. There's just two. You know, the technology is too easy to copy something and just have a new product, um, especially the motorized stuff. It just goes too fast. I, I mean, uh, last winter, I was standing over by uh, Forbes Avenue. Um, I forget if I was like right across from McDonald's, but somewhere in that area. Uh, there was a guy on a bicycle that just yelled, get out of the way. I was like 15 inches away from the from the wall just barely heard him manage to, to look and he almost knocked me over. It's like, wait, it's not my responsibility to get out of his way. One, he shouldn't be on the sidewalk and two, slow down and, you know, and going, the, uh, technically that would have been the wrong way on Forbes anyways. So again, enforcement, enforcement, enforcement. It's just, the, and it's just completely lacking. And, uh, you know, the, the, the plan doesn't do it and the city doesn't seem to enforce it. It needs to be way way more important for things to be to get done in order to make Oakland safer to, to run through because they're never going to reduce traffic if, that, if that's the problem. Thanks, Mark. Does anybody else have anything uh, that I said or I didn't say that I should have said? Something I said I shouldn't have said? Something I should have said more of? Okay, next slide. <clears throat> There are some comments in the chat. Sorry, Mar Mary Shaw has been uh, dropping stuff and then Kathy Gallagher. We'll make sure uh, that those get uh, transmitted to city planning, you guys. So, sorry, if you would like for me to reread uh, the comments in the chat, I totally can. 
please just speak up and I'm happy to read this out. Uh, okay, so infrastructure involves a lot of disparate systems, and so it can be a little hard to make sense of this chapter in that respect, but it generally reflects a lot of different initiatives aimed at increasing neighborhood resiliency, health, and sustainability. Um, there were a few head scratchers here for us about things that were missing from the plan. Uh, for example, there was no mention of the 2030 district, which was really weird because Megan like, Ziegler, who ran the action team there, is from Green Building Alliance, so why is that missing? Uh, but there also wasn't any mention of the Pittsburgh's uh, or the Pitts, Pitts Climate Action Plan uh, and lead service lines were also not mentioned anywhere in here. So it's kind of odd, a little lacuna. Uh, but of the stuff that was mentioned, <coughs> waste and recycling needs a lot more love. So Oakland has a huge trash problem. Hello, welcome to Oakland. Oakland has a huge trash problem. Um, and this section needs to consist of a lot more than just weekly recycling and student move out or material re reuse. Um, so, you know, what are the plans and goals set for res residential garbage disposal, recycling, bulk materials? Uh, we need to highlight enforcement on dumpsters and trash containment. We need to hold the landlords more accountable. Um, we need to share resources about trash and recycling rules, and we need to increase areas for disposal, uh, including hazardous materials or permanent recycling drop-offs like those at Construction Junction. Um, we need to implement more about how to uh, manage food waste and recycling at restaurants. Uh, we could include some goals or programs on composting and composting stations. I mean, a lot of this stuff is stuff which has been in the conversation and it just never made itself into the plan there. Uh, stormwater management also needs a little more detail. Um, <clears throat> uh, among the policies uh, is one to depave Oakland. Uh, we'd like that to be defined, especially for a neighborhood where available land is really scarce. Um, we like the concept of the green alleys, uh, but we'd like more details, please. Um, it's great to see something which is Oakland specific, uh, but then how is that area identified and are there other parts of Oakland that need this specific help as well? Uh, community gardens and urban agriculture. A lot of the problem that we have with community gardens here is a disconnect between willing volunteers and plots that need their attention. Oh, sorry, Peter's complaining. Uh, but making and supporting that connection is not simple and it requires continuous work. Like it is seriously labor intensive. Uh, so there could be more detail in that section about how to bridge those gaps. <clears throat> uh, open space. This section is pretty vague uh, and doesn't have concrete details in the project and program section. Um, what are the existing open spaces? What areas count as open space? Um, so for instance, the, when it, there's a reference to uh, start with an inventory and in the existing conditions report, but that's mostly represented by color-coded maps. And um, so for instance, the Hazelwood plan used a list of existing spaces uh, uh, there and that, that would help us to understand uh, the base data that's provided in, in this chapter. Um, so, um, <clears throat> uh, we love the comprehensive tree canopy uh, and the electric car studies. We'd love more of that kind of case study everywhere in the plan. Um, and, oh, we were very concerned about hillsides. Um, and, sorry, this for some reason did not make it onto this list of things. Um, I apologize. Uh, the, the hillside protection, uh, it, it's a little bit, um, it's a little bit vague about how the city should go about doing that, uh, how those programs should be designed. It's just like, remove, uh, you know, structures that shouldn't be there, and you're like, by what authority, and how, under what kind of case, and what would you put in their place, and how do you do the, main, the maintenance on the eroding hillsides, and you know, what kinds of programs and projects can there be uh, that would assist people to maintain their own hillsides uh, next to their next to their homes? What kinds of guidance should there be? Um, and uh, that, that's 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 hugely important also. Um, did anybody have things that they wanted to say, to add to what I just said there? Or contradict or change? Anyone at all? I'm looking through the chat at the moment. There's some stuff here about scooters. And Millie, you had a comment about um, tree canopy. Do you want to say anything about that? 
Uh, yeah, yes. Uh, my, my comment was just that, yeah, I like trees too, uh, but uh, I, I've never understood the rules in the city for cleaning up after the trees because I've, I've had requests, people say, oh, you ought to get a tree planted there, but, but yet it's going to be me, old lady me, out raking those leaves. I see them cleaning up in other neighborhoods, um, but I, I've never seen a, a vacuum, a leaf vacuum in Oakland, have you? And, and so I, I, I'm not rushing to get any more trees. <laughs> I tell you, that's it. That's it for me. <laughs> Anyone else have any comments about the infrastructure? Things that were missing for them in the plan, things that I didn't mention? There's a lot in here. There's utilities, there's Wi-Fi, there's beekeeping. I, I'd like to suggest about trees I'm not so concerned about raking up the leaves, um, only happens once a year, uh, but I am concerned about maintaining the trees once they are planted um, and providing the proper space for the trees that are planted and making sure that they are not planted right under the utility lines so that they will have to be butchered when they're teenagers. Um, there need to be requirements for maintenance and maintenance needs to be um, defined for those who have trees. And so um, I just wanted to speak to that. I 100% agree with what you have said. I uh, want to reassure you that the city's rules, regulations, and guidelines about tree placement and tree maintenance have actually evolved a great deal. Um, over the past couple of decades and that what we have in place right now. They do consider utility lines, they do consider the, util the subterranean utility lines, they consider the sidewalk uh, clearance and so forth. So there are a number of trees in Oakland and um, we did a little walk through this last fall with Lisa Chaffee uh, of Central Oakland. Uh, there are a number of places where there are trees that are ailing uh, that the city will not replace because they're just in the wrong place um, and there should never have been a tree there in the first place. Um, so, uh, but, but alternatively, you know, like there are better trees that could be suggested for places where uh, a tree was tried and failed. Um, the tree maintenance, the city contracts, uh, not just the city forestry, but then uh, in, a, in a collaborative program with Tree Pittsburgh, um, and uh, that's funded through a variety of different um, uh, sources, uh, but it relies a great deal on, on volunteers. Uh, and doing that in a regular way uh, in Oakland is something that is a big challenge. So uh, we are in conversation with the University of Pittsburgh uh, about how to manage that on a kind of an ongoing basis because they do have a steady supply of able-bodied people who want to learn more about trees and want to engage in tree care. Um, it's just a kind of a, a continuous effort to have to train them and support them and deploy them and organize them and so forth. So it's um, it's ongoing, it's work, it's definitely work. Um, and it's, uh, you know, a specific example that occurs to me every time I walk up Atwood Street is two old, large plane trees in the 400 block of Atwood that are breaking up the sidewalk that they're in and never had enough space. But, and I think if somebody trips over that sidewalk and sues the owner of the apartment building, he'll just come out and cut them down. Yeah, well, the, the city did the same thing with like two of the plane trees that were buckling the sidewalk and outward a couple of years ago, they just cut them down. Well, these trees should be saved, I think, but it would be for the owner to do it, it would cost too much. There should be some kind of a cooperative program, a cost sharing program for saving good old trees that still have plenty of life left in them and saving the sidewalk. Yeah. Uh, yeah, like, have, oh, go ahead. Uh, well, uh, okay, I just want to say that I'm not sure that it belongs in infrastructure because I often get confused about these four different chapters. Um, but infrastructure, I, I was thinking that um, subways, uh, or what do you call it, under under road pass through, uh, need, needed to be need to be considered. Like there's one at Heron Hill and uh, Bigelow Boulevard. And if we want to do free transportation and walking and pedestrians, um, bicycles even, 
they, maybe they could go under the highway. The Boulevard of the Allies is what I'm thinking about instead of the passovers. But then we end up having um, the overpasses because then we end up saying, oh, okay, we can't have that. We have to rip down this overpass because trucks are getting taller. And that becomes a, an, an issue. So maybe things could go underground. Although I know there's lots of pipes and, and lines uh, un, under there, but I've, I've offered that comment more than once and I, I don't see it, that getting anywhere either. So I, I, guess, I, guess, I guess I'm also saying I'm just about ready to stop making comments because I don't see them going anywhere. That's all. So yeah, and, uh, well, and I'm gonna jump on her, but so tying this back to what, to my previous comments too, with Zalima Park, what the one, the one, uh, you know, there was like one mention of, hey, let's close Zulima Street. I mean, it was actually more than that, but the, the other thing that was never considered and never even part of the, the options given was a road diet to reduce the size of, of Zulima Street to make it safer and, and better access to Zulima Park instead of just closing it off altogether. That was actually, you know, I disagree with you just slightly, Mark, because there were a couple of different design scenarios that came out of the um, that particular charrette and two of them involved a road diet for Zulima. Um, one of them would sort of angle it and the other one is just uh, really narrowing it going through. Um, but it's total. I totally agree uh, with you that what is published up there on the site doesn't give you um, doesn't give you access to those ideas uh, or doesn't really explore them in any meaningful way. Um, so um, <clears throat> yes, agree that that should definitely be something that gets considered. Yeah, it just sends you to that workshop page, but there's no synthesis done to actually say, look, this is, you know, we've got some feedback on this and here's what we think, you know, at least one option or maybe two, you know, that we could during this review process, get some feedback on, you know, and then be able to say, oh, look, here's a vision for this area as opposed to like, oh, go to 60 pages of workshop notes. So uh, there's definitely more work to be done to get this into shape for sure. Yeah, and I think it's it's part of a 10 and, you know, if, God forbid, multi-year plan, you know, doing a, a road diet first is certainly a better way to go because that way it, it doesn't, you know, restrict people, doesn't, you know, or constrict people, doesn't give them, you know, impossible ways. I mean, there's, there's absolutely traffic that goes from Halkett to Bates and vice versa and just to Panera and back that a turning lane on the Boulevard of the Allies in, in either direction is not going to alleviate. It's going to make things worse. I mean, if I'm on Halkett, I want to get to Bates. Why should I have to go all the way down to, to, to the intersection to get through there when there's already a perfectly good street there that, that could be maintained? I guess, Kat, uh, Andrea, I guess I would, and, and Wanda, I'd also like to mention that we've lost other streets in Oakland. And once you lose them, you never get them back. We lost part of Hamlet Street. We lost, uh, what's the other, um, oh, not McDivitt. I can't think of the other one, but I know we lost part of ha uh, Hamlet Street across the Boulevard of the Allies that used to go through the McGee Hospital site. And we're, lo we're losing uh, the, the uh, the street behind uh, Niagara Street because UPMC supposedly has bought that. And once again, it's sort of like, I don't understand why the city doesn't see how important it is to keep streets for public access and parks for public enjoyment. I, you know, to me, that's that's one of the, the two of the benefits of living in the city is to be able to, to, to navigate around my city, whether it's by foot or by, on bicycle or, or in a car or on a scooter. And, and to go sit in a green space some someplace. Uh, and, and just well, bother in mind that they seem quite uh, ready to give away parks and roads. Yeah, well, just to be clear, so people aren't confused, the plan does, does maintain Zulima as a park. And we would like, you know, and it, it talks about making improvements, right? And, and the workshop, I think people have had very clear, have taken that feedback very clearly that they don't want to see Zalima Street closed. What we'd like to see is the kind of thing like a drawing that would show, right, how you could do a road diet where there'd be a little bit less pavement, you know, and some of the improvements made to the area, uh, you know, and actually just present that as, you know, here's the plan we'd like to see for this area. Um, and so 
I just want people to be, you know, there has been some progress made, right, where there's some ideas and some workshops and there isn't something in the plan that says to close that street and there isn't something in the plan that says get rid of Zulima Parklet. But I just think we could go the next step further to have a nice vision drawing, you know, that really incorporated the recommendations so people could, in fact, imagine, yeah, how that green space would be once it's improved and you could have safer access to it. Um, so, yeah, so it's like we're sort of almost there. But, you know, with a lot of these revisions, you know, when you have a draft plan, we want to see revisions. We want to see, um, you know, the plan really move toward um, being better organized, being being better um, compiled, and have the specificity that helps us um, to then, you know, move forward and know what we're actually what has actually been approved. Because um, right now, if if they leave that section as it is, you'd have no idea really, because there are like a bunch of different options in those workshops, and it's just workshop notes. Um, plus, in a draft, we'd like to, you know, like see have people see, you know, and then make some comments and say, okay, well, you know, there's either two options or one option or you know that kind of thing. Well, one so other and one other is issue. A lot, um, you know, maybe for us to move more toward toward process around how we how we how we do move forward. Okay, and just to to, to make a comment too, one other problem is that regardless of what we're doing here, the UCMU for Walnut Capital is something that's wheeling its way around this plan. That it you know as has been said, this is going to be the tail essentially going to be the tail wagging the dog once that's implemented, trying to make changes through that, even if the open plan recommends it it seems very unlikely that they're going to uh, revise the brand new UCMU that, that goes into place on Halkett and uh, Boulevard. So I agree, Mark, it's a difficult thing. And I, I also, as you know, emphatically agree that it's not a great process by which that has come to pass to say it very, the very least. Um, but it, it is, as I understand it, uh, and maybe SJ, you'd like to weigh in on this or Andrew, if you're still there, um, it is, as I understand it, the city's intent that that be a new base zone. So it can be, in fact, actually modified citywide um, by an active council going forward. It would apply to all of the um, uh, areas that have that base zone in it. So, um, don't know. No, that's correct. Yeah. Thank you. It would be the only one, though, at this point. There would have to be zone change request in other neighborhoods for that base zone, like say UCMU or UCE. I, I'm, I'm sorry, SJ, I, I don't understand what you're saying. We, that changes can be made, but every neighborhood that is zoned that would have to make that request. Is that what you're saying? What I'm saying is that there's a, the existing zoning districts and the three new base zonings that are proposed, the UCMU, the UCE, and the RMU, those could be requested to be applied in other neighborhoods, but it, it would only apply essentially to Oakland at this point. But I guess, well, and I don't, I don't think, uh, if, if you think you answered the question, I'm, I'm pretty sure you didn't. The problem is that once the, the current Walnut Capital UCMU gets in, the likelihood that even if the Oakland plan uh, recommends something completely different, changing the one that, that is about to get uh, to go to city council and probably I'm guessing pass, uh, to change that to what the new uh, criteria are is not very likely. I'll defer to Andrew on that. Apologies, I didn't answer. I, I don't have an answer to that part of Mark's question. I mean, that's the, those are decisions made by you know the ultimate decision of that is, is city councils. So, um, if they, I mean, and it just you know it, to make up a timeline, if the if the current Walnut Capital UCMU gets in, it gets passed by November, and the Oakland plan finally gets its its you know uh, finalized in January, the 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 Walnut Capital version is not going to change. 
Sorry. So maybe I'm maybe I uh, and Mark, please correct me if I misunderstand you. But I think what I hear you saying is that you're saying that even if changes were to be made to the um, the base zone for urban center mixed use, um, that there wouldn't be any change that you would foresee that would reverse the decision to include Halkit in that zone. Is that what you're saying? Or would change its uh, zoning? Or any of the criteria thereof, correct. If I mean, I you know, just to, to make something up, if all the houses have to be green in the wall, current Walnut Capital and the Oakland plant says, no, they need to be blue and red, the Walnut Capital, Halkett Street is not going to change to blue and red because it's already green. The, the Walnut Capital proposal is separate from the proposal here. I understand that, but it's a UCMU which is something that this plan, Oakland plan is trying to also uh, speak to and define and give recommendations for what it's supposed to be. So again, uh, you know, uh, just making one up just because uh, to try and pick a, a specific one, Walnut Capital wants all greenhouses and the Oakland plan decides that UCMU really should be blue and red. How is that gonna affect it when, how is that gonna affect it later? It won't. I'm, I'm, I mean, I, I, I don't. I'm, it's. It, I find it a little incredulous that you're you're confused as to whether or not that the the that there would be a revision of the first one in getting changed. I I I could see where Mark's coming from too. And another concern I have is the agreement that Ganey has with Walnut Capital has something uh zulima street in it the zulima street is not going to be closed until bait street is reconfigured well you know we're talking about something different here today then because we're saying well why why don't we put something in the oakland plan about just necking down zulima street well if walnut capital uh if their plan gets approved well in 10 years whenever um whenever Re Bait Street gets reconfigured, they're going to say, well, look, here's our agreement with Ganey. We're allowed to close Zulima Street now. I, at least that's what my little brain says. And prove me I'm wrong. I wish I was. No takers, just what I expected. Yeah, I don't think that we really were expecting to um, get into um, the Oakland Crossings um, proposal in this context, um, and I didn't. We didn't. This is, we didn't prepare uh, city planning to do that either. Um, I think that a lot of this is, these are some very valid questions, um, right? And I think that there's, um, uh, <clears throat> well, it goes once again to city planning, you know, forging ahead with the Walnut Capital plan. They trimmed it down to make it even more spot zoning. Uh, the, the, I believe it's the wording on the Oakland Crossings website that the McKee was uh, the the plan for McKee is deferred. So okay, yeah, once we get this UCMU and we can build 185 feet, oh, we'll just do it on McKee too. Like I, I did the and they're recommending that it, it goes through before the Oakland plan is even done. So you know to sit here and say, and again, we're we're, we're we've made comments that uh, you know our comments and suggestions have essentially been filtered, if not ignored. Uh, to getting into the, the Oakland plan, but even if they get into the Oakland plan, it's not going to change what the UCMU is for Walnut Capital. I, I'm, that doesn't seem to, you know, that we don't know. I, that doesn't, uh, I find that hard to believe. Yeah, the um, Hellkit inclusion in the UCMU uh, I, we have yet to hear a planning rationale for its inclusion there. Um, and my understanding is that the decision to include it there is about politics, not about planning. Um, and that is a different kind of not to have to untie than um, a planning one. 
Um, that's but city planning my interpretation of this process. But city planning uh, voted <clears throat> to rec recommended to approve. That I mean, they did. It's that city planning is not immune to. Um, some of the similar kinds of forces, but it isn't, not all decisions are made for planning uh, reasons, I guess, would be my surmise. Okay, that's, yeah. I don't want, it's, I, I hate to be the dead horse, hear, but occasionally I just, it just feels compelled, yeah. As soon as we hear about um, the city council process, we will certainly let people know about that. Most definitely. And there's still no tutorial about the engaged page. Right, so next slide, Kathy, if you would. Um, <clears throat> that's among the things that I'd like to be able to bring up in process. Uh, so there's a couple of different things here, which um, some of which are about us and some of which are about the plan. Um, so I wanted to point out that we are still not done, uh, that there is an awful lot yet more uh, comments and analysis that we would like to be able to provide to city planning and uh, would like to communicate to you um, that the more community input is really needed from a lot of the people who haven't had the chance to weigh in yet. Uh, if you would please talk to your neighbors, uh, please talk to your neighbors who are not necessarily online. Please talk to your neighbors who only communicate by phone. Please talk to your neighbors who you see outside on the street. Um, and if it is possible for us to connect with them with a paper copy of the plan, we are more than willing to do that. We have uh, <clears throat> a paper version at OPDC, like I said at the beginning. Uh, we are here during ordinary business hours. Uh, I live in Oakland and I'm happy to run the plan over to anybody uh, after hours as needed. Um, <clears throat> so uh, it's, it's, a, it's, an, it's available as an option and we are going to be looking for ways to engage with folks physically in the neighborhood uh, about some of the proposals that are in this plan. Um, city planning has also, as I said at the beginning, uh, installed posters around the neighborhood in a bunch of different places that highlight specific site-specific uh, projects and programs. Uh, and uh, each of those posters has a QR code on it where you can access the engage page for that project or program and leave comments at that space. If you have any trouble navigating that or if you have neighbors uh, or you see people on the street who are having trouble navigating that, please just let us know because we would like to be able to reach out and connect and help people uh, to use that more easily. Um, <clears throat> we found when we were reviewing this from a process perspective of uh, the staff uh, that there are a lot of things missing um, that we thought would probably not have been missing had there been better resident engagement. Um, <clears throat> So a lot of the stuff, which is you know pretty unfortunately inequitous um, here, uh, is a function of the fact that voices were excluded from the planning process. Um, sort of like this, this is what you get, <laughs> um, and that's lamentable. Um, there are maybe some concrete reasons for why um, the pandemic was not the easiest uh, context or circumstance in which to have this planning process uh, function, but. I really feel like it's incumbent on us uh, as participants in the plan, as well as on city planning to look actively for ways to um, kind of get past those issues now that it is possible for us to engage people in person uh, and to not just be con content with the fact that like, you know, well, you know, Zoom and this engaged site have really worked well for, for us all along. Um, I was particularly a little bit alarmed by um, the information that I got uh, from USJ that the, the plan is intended to be published only as it is, uh, as a website, as an engage page site. Um, and as somebody with many years of experience of struggling to maintain websites, can I um, vehemently suggest to the Department of City Planning that that is not a good idea? Uh, that there is no longevity in these kinds of platforms. Uh, and like if setting aside the difficulty in navigating some of this stuff, that it is just not realistic to expect that in 10 years, you will still be able to make all of this website work, um, let alone then be able to refer to it, for instance, the next time we do a plan or two plans from now, um, as we often do. So, you know, the 
the, the original Oakland plan from 1979 is still available to people to be able to look at because it was published on paper and you can, you know, photocopy it and you can PDF it and you can archive it, you can photograph it. And those are, it's a concrete thing. It's easier for people to understand um, than a website that has a kind of a bespoke uh, uh, interface uh, or platform. Uh, staff here also acknowledged uh, that there were uh, language and other accessibility barriers to being able to read and engage with the site um, itself. Um, so the, the, there is no translation, there's, and the, a lot of the legibility um, uh, aids were not as helpful as, as people had hoped that they would be, uh, and that's an issue. Um, and then we've had some comments uh, along the way here that have also pointed out um, issues and difficulties um, that we are going to relay uh, as well. Kathy, you have your hands up. Um, yes, I do. I'd like to comment about your, you know, like I've been beating the drum in North Oakland for way longer than I wanted to, to have people be engaged and residents make comments on the program. But as you mentioned earlier, in North Oakland, we have a very large concentration of senior citizens who are not able to navigate an online platform. Um, and I keep telling them to, you know, there's that North Oakland is mentioned, go look at the Aaron Hill pumping station, you'll be able to go there. But number one, they can't find, they can't navigate the engage page. And number two, the, the few that I've talked to that have gotten on can't find where the pumping station is mentioned. Um, so it's very difficult to get. And we have a, we have a large number of residents who have been ex not excluded, but are unable to participate because of the, the platform. And by the way, I don't see anything listed in North Oakland where people could go and see the plan. And the project, the Perrin Hill Pumping Station, doesn't have a QR code sign in front of it. So it's it's difficult to get people to participate, and, and particularly in terms of residents. And I found that, I find that a lot of times um, people who are not permanent residents forget, like I, I always say, I feel like I'm channeling Dr. Seuss. You know, we are the who's down in Hoosville. We're, we are here, but it's really difficult to get senior citizens to be able to participate in this platform. Kathy, I have a question okay. for you. I 100% agree. And this isn't to say that this is going to solve that problem per se, but there's been a question in the chat about where would be a possible location in North Oakland for a paper copy. And I'm wondering if the, um, Christian Scientist Church might be willing to host one there, and if you think that that might be accessible for folks. Um, I, I, I can't speak for them, um, but we do host our, uh, you know, when we meet in per person, the Belfield Area Citizens Association meets at that church. So, um, I mean, they may be, we could reach out to them. I mean, it's convenient. Well, the school for the Blind might be another option, yeah. To you as well. The where? The School the for the school Blind. The School for the Blind. Yes. To ask. Although, um, you know, we, we had to move our voting place from the School for the Blind because public access, they didn't want people coming in. Mm. So that could be a problem. We need a community center in North Oakland. <laughs> Yeah, I think that I agree with with the way Kathy very um, clearly articulate the barriers, um, you know, and I think the same can be said for a lot of members of our community uh, who, you know, are, are working and have children and may not have access uh, to a computer or high speed internet may do most of their access on their smartphone. And it's hard to navigate something like this. Um, you know, when you're using a mobile device and, um, you know, you are, um, you know, it's just, it's not a particularly accessible um, process overall. And, you know, we understand that there is a lot of 
um, COVID related reasons, but I think to be able, um, you know, I'd really like to wrap up with again, as you know, to really stress that we would like to see changes made to this. We would like people's input incorporated. Um, we deserve a plan document that works well for our community and speaks to our community's needs, speaks to the needs of residents, uh, permanent residents in Oakland. And if we're pointing out very clear and providing very clear feedback, that would be easy to, you know, not, you know, that, that makes sense in terms of changes that could be done so that the Oakland community has a document that meets their needs uh, for a 10-year document. Um, you know, that's, that's something we believe that the community deserves. Uh, and, you know, in the extent to which now we can try to, in, you know, to increase and reach more residents um, to have their voices heard, um, the, you know, we will be doing that during the rest of this comment period. Um, but then at least the places where we've already identified where community needs um, could be at least incorporated into the plan, things that we already know are changes that we could make that would um, serve, you know, the, the people whose voices haven't been adequately heard, um, and even incorporate more recommendations about engagement and um, resources in the community section, as we've outlined, specifically looking to those groups. Um, so I think we're we're at time. We definitely want to conclude. Um, we uh, again, you know, as we said, we're not done, and we are going to keep doing more analysis, and we'll offer that. Um, there's the city is hosting a development activities meeting Monday at five thirty. There are two projects, uh, one at the Carnegie Library front steps, and another is a um, affordable housing development proposed for uh, the develop, it's a site at Forbes and Craft. Um, and then um, there's another briefing at Planning Commission for the plan. Uh, we'll, we'll have Let's Talk on Wednesday, April 20th, We'll have another Oakland wide April 26th. Um, we also have a meeting also on Monday at four o'clock uh, this coming Monday, the fourth, um, where people can learn about a study that was done um, at the University of Pittsburgh about the use of algorithms in public services and uh, equity issues associated with that. So um, check our website calendar for that and we'll be um, putting more information out about that on social media. Thanks everybody for attending. I don't know, Andrea, if you had any other um, thoughts or um, anything else to say before we conclude. I just wanted to ask if the Department of City Planning had anything that they'd like to say given stuff that's been said. Um, I, I mean, you know, like, thank you, thank you all for, I mean, you know, thanks for discussing your feedback. Um, you know, we are, you know, and, and thanks for the encouragement to, for others to be able to provide that feedback as well. Um, you know, we are trying to get as much, you know, like we, we want people to be able to review these things and we want people to have uh, these thoughtful discussions. And so, um, you know, we are, you know, that's, that's why the comment period has been extended, uh, you know, is to, to be able to provide a little bit more time to, you know, to be able to do that. Um, if there are other places, you know, even to you know, to the discussion that Kathy had around, you know, around the possibility of finding other locations to put paper copies of the plan. Um, you know, we, you know, we want to hear those uh, to be able to respond to those. And, um, you know, like I said, you know, look forward to continuing to receive feedback on the plan so that we can make sure that it is, you know, that what's, what's in the document when it goes to the Planning Commission for their adoption is, uh, you know, something that's been vetted. Is it, is it something that, that people feel reflects all of the, you know, the different populations in Oakland and and what they see for the future of the neighborhood. Thanks. Is there any? Um, no, seriously. Thank you. Is there any uh, ideas or feedback on the question of the paper 
version being published at the end as opposed to being maintained in perpetuity on Engage? Yeah, I mean, you know, I mean, there will be other ways that we'll have the document. Um, I think the primary the primary version we intend moving forward would be a version on Engage, but I mean, similar to, you know, being able to have a paper copy, you know, that was, you know, like not, you know, I would say not necessarily, um, you know, production quality, uh, you know, but, you know, one that had all of the information in it as a draft. I mean, I think we will, you know, we will have something additional, um, you know, so it, it wouldn't be the only way that it lives. I don't understand why this would be a problem. Um, am I on? You're on. Yeah. Um, I mean, the city has always produced paper documents in the past for things why would this not have a paper document? And if you want to put the, the burden like on OPDC to provide paper documents, it, this is a document of the city of Pittsburgh, isn't it? It's not uh, OPDC's document. So you ought to uh, provide paper documents to make it accessible to the most people in Pittsburgh that you can. Just clarifying that oh, okay. the paper document that we have is one that we received from the Department of City Planning and the Department yeah. of City Planning is offering. And, provide that paper draft to others as well. But the question is about how the plan is ultimately published and whether it ultimately lives as an online document yeah, or- well, It should have a paper version. Yeah, and, and, and it will It will in some form, I, you know, it, it just- what, what in some form? It should have paper for document in its in, in complete entire form. Well, I, 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 yeah, I mean, there will be a Why paper not? version of it. I, you know, I, I think that the the intent is that the primary, you know, the, the primary place that we do see hosting it is on the Engage site. Um, you know, moving forward, but you know, there will be, uh, you know, so I, I hear, I hear you, and that, and that's fine. I, and I'm not, I'm, you know, I'm not saying that we will, you know, there won't be one provided. I'm, uh, but there but will you're be not one saying provided. there will be either. No, I, I am saying there will be. It's yeah, just that, yeah. you know, I mean, uh, you know, it might be a little different than, um, you know, than what we've typically done in the past because we do see, you know, we do see the primary document moving forward being on the Engage page. But, you know, I mean, to, you know, Andrea's comments earlier around, you know, obviously, you know, websites can change and all of those things, you know, you know, that, you know, there will be multiple ways that, that it lives moving forward. We, we, we hear that and agree with that. And one of those being paper. And if paper they, is, paper is official. Paper. paper is official, yeah. Paper can't be hacked, A. Paper doesn't go down when, you know, there's a denial of service attack on the city's website. Uh, Roy, sorry, you raised your hand. Go ahead, please. No, one of the places to put it would be at the various libraries. CU libraries, Pitt Library, Carnegie Library, um, even the little free libraries, you know, there's a zillion little free libraries scattered around. There, Have you seen a lot of them. I'm not sure that they would fit in the little library. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but I think if getting, targeting the libraries would be one place to put them. They're public, they're accessible. It's an yeah, and, 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 and I think when we get to a final version, you know, that, that's definitely, you know, a, a good suggestion. Um, with the, you know, with the places that we have the paper copies of the plan now, part of, you know, part of that is making sure that there's someone who's able to collect public comment and be able to provide that, you know, that public comment to us. And so that, you know, that, so, I mean, if there are people that have little free libraries that want to, that, that want to take that on, you know, I, I, if they could, you know, please let us know. Well, the libraries themselves, CMU Library, Pitt Library. Yeah. Certainly ought to be copies there for people to comment on with comment cards. There's an excellent little free library outside of the uh, Dana's Duncan Duds on the corner of Cable and Semple, which I love and is heavily used by all the students who are doing their laundry. Totally recommend. Corner, co corner coffee shops. That too. Every coffee shop ought to have a copy. If you want comments, get, com get them out there where people can see it and make comments on it. Coffee shop's a good place for it. 1,000% right. Okay, 
Great. Um, thank you all very much for everybody's inputs and questions and comments as we go along. Um, please feel free to reach out. Uh, here's a whole bunch of ways to contact us uh, and uh, let us know if we've missed anything. And we will keep you informed, as Wanda was saying. And going forward, uh, we will have uh, other meetings this coming April uh, that will be very specifically about this feedback process uh, and clarifying the contents of the plan. So I thank you very much to the city planning folks who showed up um, and to Domi, thank you very much, Dave, for showing um, and um, uh, have a great evening. Thank you very much for your time. Thanks everyone. Everyone. Thank you, Wanda. Thank you, Andrea.